So you're joining me at Holcroft Fisheries near Retford, Nottinghamshire. Beautiful complex. It's what I call a, a sort of semi-commercial, semi-natural. When I say that, it's open to the elements. There's always quite a bit of wind. Um, we've got a bit of a breeze here today. And, uh, and I think that keeps the water moving around a lot and you get a lot of tow and um, it, it creates an interesting venue. It's not the easiest place to fish, but it's very, very rewarding. And basically the reason we've come today is because the weather's on the change. So we've had uh, some really cold weather. It's only three or four weeks ago. Uh, the place was frozen solid and uh, we had a couple of matches cancelled. But we've had a big lift in temperatures. It's late winter, early spring. We've seen the signs of spring coming along. And um, overnight, you know, the last couple of nights, the temperatures lifted dramatically. It's 12 degrees this morning at six o'clock. And um, we're now probably, it's probably 13 degrees as we stand. It's a lovely mild day. And I've noticed recently the fish are starting to become a little bit more active. And what I wanted to see today is that could we feed a little bit more? Do the fish want some bait? Are they on the move? Are they starting to eat? As they transition out of winter and into spring. So we've plonked ourselves down here on the bridge pool. I'm on peg 15. Yeah, just check it. Uh, peg 15. And um, it's a good area. It holds fish. It's sort of middle of this uh, big bank here. And um, we're going to try and target skimmers and possibly roach. And if we're really lucky, an odd bream. Um, we just want to, you know, fish a nice, steady away, commercial, late winter, early spring session, and talk you through what our thoughts are and how the fish feed. And so join me, Mick Biles, here at Allcroft for a little late winter, early spring session. So I've gone for my go-to mix uh, for this time of year. First thing is it's dark, you'll notice it's a very dark ground bait. And that's basically, I've mixed up two and a half pints of uh, F1 dark and half a pint of Thatcher's. What I have done is I've mixed it on the damp side. So it's almost, it's not wet, but you can see it's quite, it's quite damp, a little squeeze and it, it makes quite a ball. And you can hear how heavy that is. The reason for that is I want it to be heavy. I want it to sit uh, down on the bottom. I don't want it to be dry and fluffy and whizzing everywhere because the skimmers uh, on, on Holcroft especially, or a lot of commercial fisheries, uh, especially in seven foot, you know, seven and a half foot, what is probably what we're gonna be fishing in today. They wanna to sit off bottom and I don't really want to encourage that. So what have I brought bait wise, particles? Um, just get me a little sieve out of the way. So part of casters, part of maggots, um, essential here. I'm just going to put them in that bait tub. And then a couple of little tubs here with some deads in. So these are just in water. These are my dead reds. And what I like to do, because I think it keeps them better, is I like to drown my maggots to kill them. Some people like to scold them. Some people like to bag them down. I basically, the night before or the evening before, the day before, which is you know even better if you can do it at least 24 hours, is pour some maggots, a quarter of a pint in there, uh, cover them with water. I just use these little uh, Tupperware containers, if you like, with a little seal on, leaving them in the fridge. And that basically kills them. What it also does is it maintains the colour and the texture. It makes them you know, sort of fairly soft, nice to hook. And I think more natural, um, like a dead maggot, as opposed to a scalded one. So I'm gonna add a few of those into my mix. Uh, I'm just gonna get myself a bowl, because um, I like to just sort of prepare it in a, in a one. And uh, basically, I'll take a measure, I've got a pint measure, bait tub, and I'm just going to do a couple of pints of that into a bowl so that I can sort of use that as a record um, and an understanding of what I've fed, how much I've fed. So if you come back to a venue or you go to another venue, you've got somewhere to sort of work from, uh, some idea of what you've, what you've done. And to that, I'm just going to add uh, some of my dead bait. I've done a few dead pinkies as well. So it's a good pinch of dead maggots. Nice pinch, similar sort of amount of dead pinkies. They're mixed fluoros. And I will drop an odd caster in there 
just to kick me off. I always like to have a few casters on the bottom. I find that they're um, a bait for big fish and it just sort of, they sit there quite dormant and they'll pick another one up. I'm not going to put that one in, I'm just going to put a pinch in. It's more of a psychological thing. But what I will actually do, um, because I intend, so I've part of maggots and a part of casters, I intend to lose feed um, casters on, on a shorter line, which I'll go through uh, with you. And basically, the maggots, I will probably uh, be tempted or inclined to lose feed a few of those over the top of my long line to draw the fish down and pull them into the swim and encourage them because they sort of sit up and sometimes they just sit mid-water and you can't make them go down to the bottom and the loose feed just gathers the fish and sucks them and, and pulls them down and allows you to be able to catch them. But we'll find that through the session and you know we'll understand what's happening today. Um, but the casters will certainly lose feed on the short line because that encourages bigger fish. We'll probably catch a few roach on them first because that seems to be the way uh, at this venue. And then hopefully uh, the big bream will come in later on, push them out, and we'll catch them later on in the session. So let's give it a whirl. So we've got settled and we've got us peg. We've arranged his bait. Probably really important to talk about is some rigs. Um, so I've decided to fish because I know the lake a little bit, 13 meters uh, long for skimmers and bream, and then shorter, just at the bottom of the near side shelf, which will be basically the top three, um, or top four in old money, because these don't have a number one in, and then two sections, so about six meters. And I've set up two rigs for that, dead simple, a four by 14s, nice and slim, which is ideally to lay in nice and, uh, keep me in that line nice and tight, and catch fish as the hook bait's falling through the water. And then a 0.6, which is more of a round bodied float, uh, little all the tip uh, with a sort of wire stem. And then that's more stability so that I can drop it in nice and firm and hold on. That's got about four inches uh, on the bottom. Uh, so that's all the depth basically. All the lead is spread uh, in the bottom, it's 450, 500 milli uh, millimeters. And it's bulked and then the shots are spread, 16 inch lens. They've got nice light uh, gamma green, gamma katsu green hooks and they're 16s, which sounds like a big hook, but it's actually very, very light. And then from a short line, I've got two rigs. Uh, one is a 0.4 bolt, and that is exactly bolt. And that's 400 millimeters from the bottom with just three droppers. So I can just see that up bit falling. And then I've got one that's sort of 400, 50, 500 mil spread if I'm if I'm going to catch roach uh, before hopefully the bream um, turn up at the end. We could catch a few bream, a few big perch on that short line. So my long rigs are set up on four to six um, zip hybrid elastic. That's a little bit more forgiving. There's a lot of poles, a little bit of wind. So when I strike, I need a bit more forgiving. Whereas my short rigs are on six to eight because I want to set that hook. I might hook a carp, as I said, I might hook a big perch and I want to set that hook into that. Um, my little bulk rig, which is more positive, has got a slightly heavier um, GP109 on and that's in a 16 and I can use double maggot and that sort of thing with that. So hopefully those rigs should put us right for today's session. And that feels like it another better fish and we had one just over a pound the cast before if it don't get too bright and this wind behaves itself we might finish up catching a few of these I'm just gonna take the opportunity to feed my short line and that one Strangely enough, was also wrapped around, and that must be the way that they're feeding. So, it, when I netted it, the the line was round its fin, but it was right tucked in the mouth. And that's as these skimmers are dipping down to the bottom, and you can see the bites and the indications on the floor. And the beauty of today is that we've got a nice bit of tow, which allows us to keep a tight control on this rig. Um, and in some ways that's a fantastic advantage, but in others it means you see everything because your line's tight, 
and um, these skimmers, especially here at Allcroft, and any commercial fishery really, um, they're notorious for sitting off the bottom, mid-water, especially sort of halfway down to three quarters of the way down in the depth. So what I'm actually doing, and I think that's what's promoting bites for us, is to uh, keep trickling, or pinging as we call it, an odd maggot, so half a dozen maggots, and I'm just trying to sort of put them just to the left of my float so that the toe that's picking up on the lake just settles them in my target area, which is over where we cupped his ground bait at the start, and um, that ground bait were quite quick to work. So the decision to pot the ground bait in, not in balls, but in a firm sandcastle, I think the nickname for it is, that all the guys used it. So we've mixed it nice and damp and then pressed it hard into the cup, as you saw. And that breaks up quite quickly, spreads across the bottom, and these skimmers like to sit over and above that. But as I say, over it and not down on it. I think it's a massive myth that bream and skimmers live on the bottom. Not true, especially here. So I'm just, because there's a few fish in my peg, and I've got a couple of liners, and I've actually fired up to a couple. I'm just gonna put a little firm ball with a few dead maggots in, just to try and concentrate the fish and draw them back into the bottom of my peg. Because, it's not good having them in your peg if you're actually not catching them. So I'm just gonna, one sort of golf ball size ball, and just see if that'll focus the fish back onto the deck where we can catch them. And I'm actually going to pick up my slightly heavier rig for the same reason slightly heavier float in the shape of a 0.6 so we just potted that little golf ball in try and focus the fish towards the deck and stop them sitting up in the air and hopefully hold this bait a little bit still I've got a little bit more line up bottom with this one this is like four inches over depth and it's a slightly rounded body there you go see i can't help myself picking the catapult up um more of a rounded bodied float that i can just hang on to a little bit more and just keep that bait nice and still oops and as if by magic and that looks like a nice fish as well and that will literally first drop so we aren't jumping to conclusions and claiming I've created some kind of miracle. That little bit of action sent to work. It's not a big fish. But it were quick, it were instant, and it were response to a little bit of action. And understanding what's happening in your peg is one of the keys to keeping fish flowing, building a weight, especially if you're in a match, and you're in match conditions. You can spend a lot of time chasing shadows, and at the end, you've not really converted all the bites and indications into fish, and therefore into a good match weight. So, not the biggest fish we've had, but it seems that these which 
sometimes can be quite <coughs> aggressive feeders, despite the delicate nature of small skimmers. I often find that when there's a few of them, they're very competitive. I'm still loose feeding my short line because it's probably not towing quite as much there because it's not out in the middle of the lake. I mean, that's obviously 13 metres where I'm fishing out in the open water and you get more circulation of the wind and the tow and that's, we've got quite a bit of tow on that, but that's probably not the case closer in. So for the time being, I'm still loose feeding, hopefully drawing in fish all the time, where we can drop onto that as like a quiet swim, a swim that we've built slowly, where fish are comfortable, they've gained confidence, which will allow us to drop in and catch a few better fish. That's about straight to air. So it is quite obvious that the smaller stamp have reacted to what we've done. But nonetheless, we take all comers. That's a bite and look straight away. That looks like a better fish. There are some fantastic bream in all these lakes, but Bridge certainly has more than its fair share. Surprising, you know, I've got that light hook on and that's a nice older specimen, brown in colour. I think he's a little bit older, I won't call him a virgin fish, but more than welcome. And I think, I think that's a slightly better fish. I just kind of let that float run a little to the down toe side of the where we think the ground bait is of course as we always presume just another real nice skimmer 12 14 ounces and he would just sat off the back of the bait and that toe is definitely stronger now than it's been all day and that's that wind sort of got opened although we're sheltered here from the wind we're not sort of in the wind but if you look down the lake you'll see that it's quite in the wind and on that bowl and that's probably getting stronger and creating this stronger toe so i'm actually going to lay my rig off to the right to start with, shorten the process because if that's where the fish are sat then we might as well put his rig straight into their uh, waiting mouths and sure enough there's another one sat back there look. so to put that into sort of context that's I'm going to say three quarters to a metre down Tow, or if you want to look at it like the sort of dial of a clock, as base at 12 o'clock, and we're probably past one o'clock. And there, those slightly better fish, not the biggest ones we've had, but they're better ones. Is that because they're all sat just back, picking up, sat on the scent of the ground bait? One or two have been picking off the maggots that have been falling through. We stopped those feeding quite a while ago, but that don't mean to say there's not quite a few maggots 
if you like, spread through the swim. So we'll just keep an eye on that. And I mean, I've fed twice now with those sort of top up nuggets. So that's, just to put it in perspective, that's where me, when the float settles, that's where we've cupped in. I'm just gonna lift my float for you to see. That's where the last two fish have come from and they just sat off the back. So it just pays to keep an open mind. You know, we've been obsessed by nailing that float, nailing the bait where we think all this bait is. But obviously the fish have got other ideas. Now, we did think that we'd had a carp or even possibly some big bream in a swim because it just went a little bit quiet. Is that what's pushed them down? Or is it just the fact that that's where, where they want to be? It looks like that's where they certainly are. So it pays to search around in your swim. I think is what we've uh, determined from that. And the, them last three fish have all been peas in a pod. And that's probably the little group, little shoal. Living together. because I'd be inclined to drop another little ball in to try and pull them fish back to where we think we should catch them but if they want to sit there the chances are that we'll catch a few and then they might move back onto the bait when we've disturbed where they sat. I don't want to overfeed it just because they, they've gone off the bait doesn't necessarily mean that by feeding it we can draw them back onto it. They might actually, we might have put too much bait in. Time will tell. And sure enough, I mean that, I'm gonna say that were even further away. That were a metre and a half. There's always a lesson in fishing and just when you think you understand it, the fish will teach you otherwise and every day is a school day. As I was once told. Another one wrapped around, look. But it is a better fish, over a pound. It is in the mouth. Just the monkeys for that, which is probably a good indication of, and I should I say proof, is why you do get so many line bites and why you foul up so many fish, because those skimmers, the fins, they like to hover above your bait and of course to do that what they have to do is spread their fins and just sort of sail in the tow and um, your line catches on it really easy. You can probably tell the sort of excitement in my voice because it always mesmerises me that you, because we've caught them fish on that bait, thinking that, that yeah, they're coming onto it and we've nailed them and we've put the, the mixture of nuggets in and we caught straight off the top of it. But I think there's more tow than there's been all day. That's gone straight in, look. We've obviously found where they hold up. And we're now even fishing, it, sort of in line with that from where I'm sat, in line with that spinner, which is miles away. But as I said, we'll just keep taking them while they're coming. Why not? You might have noticed that when I feel like it's a slightly better fish, I break down on the next section, which is basically like your top two. 
because I feel you can pull your fish closer to you and then it'll be easier to net and the smaller fish you can kind of get them to come to you and pull them over the net but we're fishing this fine fine hook nice light elastic which I think one of the most important things or one of the things that I like about fishing with light elastic is that when you do up your fish they don't bounce around in your swim and with a stronger elastic when you hook into them they'll sort of dart around in your swim and unfortunately I always feel that disturbs the fish in the shoal that you're hooking your fish from so by using that slightly softer as I said this is a four to six zip that when you hook your fish they don't sort of they just sit and then you draw them out of the swim quietly which in turn hopefully keeps them content and feeding undisturbed allowing you to catch more fish could be a bream. So we've just dropped onto this short line because well basically after that little session of catching those um, is that wrapped over? I seem to be getting quite a bit of that today. Um, yeah it is look. We don't mind as long as they're in the net. It's when they come off that's annoying. So that one's on double maggot. So I just dropped onto this short line because we had that little session, little spell on this long line where the fish had dropped down toe of the bait and um, yeah, you know, sort of lowered it into where I thought the, the nest of skimmers were, plundered three or four fish, I think it were. Um, great. But then my peg went quiet. So I might have got a little bit greedy. Um, gone into the sort of epicenter, disturbed the shoal, and dispersed them, which might not be the smartest thing to do. So I've actually fed a nice rich ball. When I say rich, that means I've put a few extra dead maggots in it. So no more ground bait, but with a, a bit more meat inside it. Uh, in, in the form of dead maggots and then I've come off that because I'd like to think that I'll get them fish to regroup because as we mentioned earlier on this long line these fish definitely do sit off the bottom cruising about in the uh, in the tow just dipping dipping down to the bottom, as and when they please. They're not, as textbooks would lead you to believe, all tails or peds down, bunching away on the bottom. It's a, it's a fallacy. Which I think today's session, and some of the bites you've seen, and you know how quick they've come after laying the rigging, and the indications, I think that's probably been a good way of demonstrating how these fish do feed. Now I'm hoping that that we've not gone on this too early and sort of disturbed um, the fish that were settling. But because I wanted to let them fish regroup on the long line, I just had a cheeky look. We've had three good skimmers and three roach, but no bream yet. Maybe they'll come later as the light drops and the bigger fish come looking for food, which I think is what actually happens. I mean, people look at bream and um, don't necessarily see them as margin fish, but here at, at Allcroft, 
they behave very much like carp do. I mean, they are commercial fish when all said and done. And at the end of each session, a lot of people, you know, wrong though rightly, throw the bait in the edge. Um, and the fish get tuned into that. And they know that as the light fades, there's, there's food in the margins. It's a little bit safer, they've got a bit more confidence. You know, um, they, they feel, they don't feel as predated because it's a little bit darker. And in they come. And that's kind of what we're trying to recreate by building a swim slowly. There's quite a bit of bait there, that real little dink, and and that's one look. And um, I mean, you wouldn't have said that with a textbook skimmer bite, but any stroke of the imagination, it was just a little dink where it pick, picked it up. Lovely fish. Um, yeah, and we're trying to recreate that by building this slow swim where there's a nice quiet area um, where the fish have got confidence to come in and settle up and gorge themselves. So basically we left that line because we felt like we dispersed the shoal, fed and left it alone while we had a little look on the inside line. And I think that's four fish in four drops when we've gone back on it and one of them were a two pounder. So it just goes to show that resting your lines can be massive. What I have noticed, um, while we've been resting it, that wind's just changed direction. And this is something that you should always observe. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, when you're fishing is that the wind's kind of more, it was more off my back and now it's more down and and that's completely changed. Sent the ducks up as well. Um, it's completely changed the tow, so it's not towing as much. So I've also just picked my catapult up because as we were saying earlier, when it's not towing as much, the fish are kind of inclined to sit up in the water when it is towing, it kind of pushes them down and makes them feed. We probably need to um, just pick that catapult up again to increase them fish to follow that loose feed to the bottom. Draw the fish down to where we want them. It might be worth picking up the lighter rig that we had on earlier that will allow us slower fall of bait because if they are sat up off the bottom and we don't need the stability, that would have poor effort of a bite <clears throat> it was just holding on to it and that's another sign that it's not towing as much the bites in general when it's not towing never as good because the fish aren't moving as much they sort of sat they'll mouth the bait and sit there with it in the mouth so this bite that I've just had a couple in a couple of chokes so I'm just gonna swap that rig for the slightly lighter one, which is a 414s, if you remember from earlier. And that should just allow me to hang on to the float. It's a different shape. And, where are you? There you are. <clears throat> it's a slightly different shape, and that allows you just to hang on to the float and sort of hang that hook bait, hang your hook up in the water a little bit more. giving you more time for fish to intercept your hook bait as it's falling through what I suspect is a suspended ball of fish. Now that's one. Now that were actually sat still. I'm not going to claim that that were falling through the water at all, but... <clears throat> It were a lovely little dink. It feels like a good fish. Now this is on that lighter hook. That plastic's just doing everything that it should do. Might even need to pull a little bit of that elastic. 
that's the beauty of side pullers, even on light elastics on your silverfish rigs, that you can use a soft elastic, and every now and again, you'll just need to just tension it while you're netting your fish. Another two pounder. Beautiful. Now, we have just been tr trickling a few maggots in, so, you know, you've got to sort of keep yourself busy, keep your peg active, ring the changes and make sure that you don't just sort of sit there thinking that everything's gone and they're not feeding anymore. Always presume that the, the fish are there, especially when it comes to these skimmers. They can be an enigma, to say the least. So, we've dropped onto the short line and, ah, that were a carp. I thought it was. And I suppose that's the other side of the weather coming warm is that um, those carp that usually are bundled up in, uh, in the corners or under the reeds and things like that start to move looking for bait and of course we uh, we're bound to encounter a few and that was one let's see if there's a bream sat behind it though now that that's cleared off out of the swim and that had had it in its mouth because the bait were chomped sure sign that the fish are feeding there's loads of indications and dinks and taps and because there'll be roach there and skimmers and straight into a fish which I'm saying isn't a carp and that just goes to show you look literally and then seconds of dropping it back in after losing a carp And that is exactly what we've built that swim for all day. Some of them. And I'm calling that a bream. Beautiful. And I think that's another skimmer. I were hoping for another bream, but I don't think that's been the case. We had that carp and one bream a skimmer, and we'll call that a good skimmer, not quite the bream we were hoping for to finish the session. But I think that just concludes a lovely, enjoyable pleasure session practice. For me, I've learnt a lot. I hope we've given you an insight into um, what happens when the weather changes. Basically, as we said earlier, the temperature's gone up, the fish are on the move, they're starting to eat bait. We've been a little bit more aggressive, a bit more positive than um, I certainly have been in the matches here uh, of late. And, um, and the fish have responded accordingly. So just keep an eye on the temperatures, keep an eye on the weather, look out for local match results, find out what's been caught and you know what people are catching, what sort of fish. And um, you know that's the way to learn and to give yourself more chance to catch more fish. I've had a great session and thanks for joining us and uh, we'll see you again soon.